This image of the sky shows the cosmic background microwave radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang, the moment of creation. It reveals minute temperature fluctuations of the order of less than a thousandth of a degree that grew to become the myriad galaxies of the cosmos. Welcome to the universe, the aggregation of all space, time, matter and energy. It's an extraordinary place. As British evolutionary biologist John Haldane once said, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. And not only that, as Einstein remarked, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And what better person to aid our comprehension than the 2011 Nobel Physics Laureate, Professor Brian Schmidt of the Australian National University in Canberra. He launched the inaugural event of the Age Science Series. And here are some highlights of his speech. So when I came to Australia, I was starting you know, uh, astronomy career, and I said, I want to do something big. And I said, measuring the universe's past so that I can understand its future, is the universe going to be, is it infinite, is it finite, is it going to last forever? That seemed to me just about the biggest question I could do. And you can imagine going through and measuring the expansion rate and doing an experiment where you go back in time and you measure the expansion rate back in time. And so if the universe is coasting, that is, it's not speeding up or slowing down, then when I look at this diagram, it will be expanding at the same rate then as it is now. Now it turns out the expansion rate, the current epoch expansion rate, we call the Hubble constant. In this thing, I'm talking about something that's a little different than the Hubble constant, but you can think of it being essentially the same as the Hubble constant. On the other hand, if I make this experiment and I do uh, look in the past and I see that the universe was expanding faster in the past and has recently slowed down, then on this side of the this trajectory, if I have a trajectory that goes steeper, then the universe is going to end in the future and the universe is finite. The other side, well, the universe goes on forever and is infinite. And finally, you could imagine a universe which is doing something silly which would be speeding up. So how are we going to do this? Well, nature gave us something, a super light bulb, a super standard candle. And these things are things we call type 1a supernovae. So our sun is about 5 billion years old. In 5 billion years, it's going to puff up and eventually collapse down into a little star we call a white dwarf a star that is a million times denser than water. If our sun were created as a binary, then the same process happens, except for the second star can go through the same process and eventually start putting material onto this little white dwarf star. And as these white, store, white, white dwarf stars get heavy, they become unstable at 1.38 times the mass of our sun and they explode as giant thermonuclear bombs, the biggest bombs in the universe. You can imagine a, a hydrogen-like bomb, a thermonuclear bomb, that is the size of our sun, all going off at once. Well, these things occur. They take about 20 days to reach a brightness five billion times brighter than our sun, and then fade away into oblivion. These objects create about 70% of the iron in the universe. So the chair you are sitting on has the iron created in one of these in it. They are very important objects to our lives. So I wasn't the only one who had this idea. Turns out there was a team that started in 1988, rather unsuccessfully initially, led by Saul Perlmutter. And here we are in Aspen, several years ago, duking it out because our teams were well known for being extremely competitive. Saul came up from a particle physics uh, background. I came from an astronomy background. We had a very different way of approaching the experiment. But we had big teams behind us, and uh, we had the benefit in the competition of understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses. And in the end, that was an incredibly important ingredient 
for us to make this experiment. That competition made us much better at doing our science. The other thing we had was technology. In 1993, the Keck telescopes, the largest telescopes, sort of the modern day equivalent to the Hooker 100 inches, inch telescopes, were uh, uh, dedicated, had, they had their first light. And these enabled us to see these distant objects and spread their light out so that we could actually get a spectrum of it. It just was not possible before 1994 to do that. Finally, one other thing, we had to discover these things. And the thing that was invented that got bigger and bigger were digital detectors, the same things that you have in your cameras. We call them charge couple devices. And these allowed us for the first time in 1994, 1995 to see a big piece of the sky, about a little smaller than the full moon. But we needed to find or to look to find objects. We had to look at big pieces of the sky because type 1a supernovae are very rare. They only happen in our own galaxy every 250 years or so. So you have to look at thousands upon thousands of galaxies to find one. And to do that, you take a big picture of a sky. So here is one of our images taken. This one was taken in 1996, I believe, in Hawaii. There's about 5,000 galaxies there. And the key, in, in, and 8 million pixels. And we would take uh, one of our images in 1996 had eight of these. So 64 million pixels. And we would take them every 90 seconds. And so we would get 50 gigabytes of data in a night. Now 50 gigabytes doesn't sound much now, but in 1995 our hard drives were one or two gigabytes. And if you think I was running around with you know, a supercomputer, think again. I had the same stuff, you know, I had a little PC at home and it was tough going. But what we were able to do was to find objects, and I'll show you where the object is here. It's this little guy. And the reason we know is we took two images. We borrowed this technique from Saul Perlmutter, who spent six years using it before we actually started finding supernovae. And so nothing here became something in the 24 days that elapsed between these two images. Now we had to write programs that would automatically sift through the data and point out these things. And that was one of the things that I spent my first couple years doing. And so this object turned out to be five billion light years away. It exploded before the Earth was formed. So we have this amazing time machine. I can't look to the future, it turns out, but I can always look backwards in this universe. But don't think you can see yourself. So, 1998. Adam Rees sends me an email and says, have a look at this. So I looked at it. This is my experiment, looking back and measuring this, the expansion rate back in time. And I looked at that and I said, OK, there's the trajectory for a universe which is finite. To explain, each of these points has an uncertainty associated with it. And that's because we're not able to perfectly measure distances. And so these, these objects say that most of the time it's between here and there. Now on average, if you look at these objects, you can see that they're consistent with this line or that line equally. On average, they're, they don't really favor. But when you get out here, not a single one of those objects is consistent with a universe that's going to end in the future. I was very depressed. I wanted the universe to have sort of some end. It seemed nice. It was aesthetic. But I have learned that the universe does what it wants, and it doesn't really care what I think about it. Then I got concerned, because then I put the part of the diagram where the universe is slowing down because of gravity. And I said, hmm, some of these points are consistent with that, but on average, they're not. They lie above that yellow region. And when you did the formal analysis, it turns out that we were 99.99% sure that on average those points lied above that yellow region. And I said, Adam, I think we've made a mistake. So Adam Reese, who was um, the youngest person on the team, I turned out to be the second youngest person on our team of 20 people, went through and figured out that this meant that the universe had negative gravity. Now, I didn't know what negative gravity is. They never taught me about that in school. You could have gravity, that is, you could have mass, but you could not have negative mass. That didn't make any sense. 
So I assumed we made a mistake. We did not say, Eureka, we've discovered something huge. We said, we've made a mistake. And so we spent several months sifting through the data, trying to sort out what we might have done wrong. Eventually, it was clear we had not made a mistake. We didn't know what it meant. Well, we knew what it might mean, but we were scared. Unbeknownst to us, the other team with whom we had essentially never agreed on anything in public before got the same answer. And the two of us groups showed the world our results in 1998. And so it is for that work that uh, the Supernova Cosmology Project, uh, with a couple Australians on it, um, we have Warwick Couch here at Swinburne now, and Brian Boyle, who is uh, the director of the Square Kilometre Array Australia, um, both on Saul's team. And uh, our team, here we are, all lined up at the Nobel Prize ceremony. Uh, normally, astronomers do not wear white tie and tails. Uh, <laughs> but give us a good excuse, we'll, we'll do almost anything.